Uh, yeah, so I'm Dane Giffen. Um, to start off by thanks, uh, thanking Maxon for having me out here and to be able to present. It's a great pleasure and be surrounded by other talented artists. Uh, so a quick backstory. Uh, I'm originally from Melbourne, Australia. And then a few years ago, I made my way out to Vancouver. And here I work at a studio called Swivet. And primarily, it's motion design uh, and then touching on some new media stuff like projection mapping and installations. And then additionally, I also do freelance with like other studios locally and internationally. Uh, so I'll start off by just showing you guys my showreel, and then we'll just jump into the presentation. From my reel, you probably would have saw that I've done a, like some photo sort of real materials like woods and fabrics and things like that. And I want to touch on that today. So it's sort of like tactile design, really getting in macro and seeing that detail through fabrics and really showcasing metals and woods and things like that. And I want to take it back to a project that I did late last year, uh, freelancing with a design motion studio called More and More. They needed me to R&D a Nike airbag, and the airbag is like this little cushion plastic thing that goes into the heel and soles of Nike shoes. And they wanted me to model it up and then just visualize it in an interesting way that they can then show the client. Uh, so over a few days, I came up with this plastic sort of wrapper that has um, fabric and dynamics uh, inside of it, and if I just play that, I'll show you sort of what the edits that I rendered out. So you can see that while exploring, this was like the R&D phase, so I was just rendered out at different stills of, of what I was uh, getting. But the, the, the technique that I used I thought was quite interesting and maybe you guys can like, you know, be able to use this and apply it in new ways. So especially like this kind of dense look of fabric rolling through here I thought was quite interesting. So uh, today I'm going to run you through sort of start to finish of a project like this. Um, but because it was late last year, I was a bit rusty on it. So I just redid uh, the project for you guys today was SIGGRAPH, so I'm going to be able to cleanly remember and have like working files and everything. So this is the project that we'll work on today. And we'll start at modeling, build it out, uh, and then go into the collision deformer and how we can get animation, and then we'll go into our fabrics and spline dynamics and things like that. So first things first is uh, the plastic that sort of surrounds this wrapper. We'll model this up, and then we'll do the inner fabric um, and sort of base ourselves up to going into it further. So this will be using splines and the loft deformer, uh, loft generator. So let's just jump into cinema and get into it. So essentially, this is what we're going to be creating. It's like a plastic shell. And if we turn it off, we've also got a couple of pieces of inner fabric that would be sort of hovering inside. So let's just turn off our reference and get into it. 
So if you go into the spline section, you can go to the flower, and this is just the fast way for me to do the, today's presentation. And if we go across the plane and we can drop it down to the XZ, it's a bit too flowery at the moment, so we're going to go down to three. And essentially, this is the shape that we're going to be using throughout the whole piece, and it's a lot of duplication. So if we even start by duplicating it now, and then we start by putting it into the loft generator, drag them both in, and you can see that we're lofting already. It's pretty low in polygons at the moment, so we're going to want to step the subdivisions up. It's only at 30 at the moment, so let's go nice and high, like 400. And we can lift the second loft up a little bit, and you can see like what the loft does. It's like a good way for modeling certain things really fast, depending on what you're needing. This is sort of a good trick. Um, so that we only want to go up a little bit at the moment. And when we do our collision animation with this fabric and our plastic and everything like that, you need a lot of subdivisions going through the top cap here. And at the moment, you can see it's really low quality and it's in uh, triangles. But we can easily fix that by going across into our loft, into our caps. And instead of triangles, let's go to quads. And then we want a regular grid. So that fixes that up. But let's get it even nice and dense, like three. So that fixes that. And then now it's pretty simple. We just do duplication of the um, spline again. And this time we want to go a little bit smaller in radius. So say like 95, 195. That takes it in. Let's duplicate it again. Let's go up a bit. Let's duplicate it again. And let's go a bit smaller again in size. And just like that, you can already see that this is coming across to be uh, this top piece of the plastic here. It's just wrapping around and going around. And whenever I'm sort of making anything and I want it to be physically accurate, I sort of think about it, how it would it be in real life. So if this was plastic, it should have a little bit of thickness to it. If it went through a manufacturing process, it really wouldn't be one whole piece of plastic. It would be two pieces of the plastic that then got sealed together in the middle and you sort of get this uh, this little beading of lighting that bounces so it sort of feels like it's a sealed piece. So that's what essentially I uh, did in that scenario here. If we just jump back into cinema. So let's just call this one top plastic. And for the most part, like you can, uh, I'd, I'd tweak this a little bit more. Maybe I'd lift the top spline up so it sort of had a bit more of a rounding look. Um, but mainly that's it. Apart from if we look at our caps, the bottom piece here is still a cap. We don't want that because we're going to have a bottom piece of plastic. And that's easy enough. We go to our caps under the loft generator. And on this one, we're going to turn it to none. And that fixes that step there. And then lastly, I said that you know it would like be good to have a bit of thickness. So if we select the loft generator and we go across holding down Control or Alt or something, uh, and we go across the cloth and select the cloth surface. It's added more subdivisions, but we don't need that right now. We can go back to zero, but we want a little bit of thickness. So something like 0.2 centimeters, just two mils, really helps with uh, when it comes to the rendering and lighting phase to sort of achieve that right real look. And you can see now that we've got that little bit of thickness working. However, if you go up to here, we've got a little bit of a break happening, and that's Simple enough, you go back into your loft and create single object, and that will stitch everything together and make it a clean object. So from there, we could duplicate this whole setup and call this one bottom plastic. Let's keep a clean hierarchy and drag it down. And essentially, we were just lifting our splines each time, and we made that top piece of plastic. This time, we could just go into our coordinates, and if we type in negative, technically we should just create our bottom piece of plastic because it's going to reverse everything. And voila, second piece of plastic there. And it's got everything set up with it, with the thickness. And what we want to do now is create that inner piece of fabric that will have the top piece and the bottom piece, and we can apply hair to it. 
and when we do the collision and run it through, the hair's not going to push through the plastic or anything like that. And essentially, we're just using the splines again. So let's duplicate again. Turn these ones off. And call this top fabric. And we just need a single plane. We don't need all this curvature around here. So if we even flick this stuff off, you can see the different splines that we've used to make up our uh, modeling piece here. But we really just want something that's going to be a bit smaller and condensed under the plastic. And this top one here that we used for the last loft is going to work fine. So if we delete the others here and we flick the loft back on, now you can see that we've just got this mesh here that's going to work as our top and bottom piece of fabric. Uh, however, it is still sitting flush with the plastic, so you'd want to go into your side view. And you can see that's our plastic here. So we just want to bring this one down a little bit so it wasn't hovering exactly where the plastic was. And essentially, that's the modeling phase that we've just got ticked off, and we can move into our animation phase. So if I even just quickly delete this stuff and just go back to the reference. Essentially, we just made this plastic shell. And then you would have a top and bottom piece of fabric that was sitting inside your plastic, not touching, and just with a bit of breathing room around. So back to the presentation. Sorry, I think I closed it before. So now we want to go into this phase. We're not going to start covering this spline dynamics in here yet. We just want to do this rolling motion effect. And it's pretty easy. Just follow along. And if you're in, even if you're a new beginner, it's, like, uh, it's not too difficult to follow along with. So we'll use the collision deformer. And then eventually, we'll be using the mesh deformer to like, take what we've uh, collided with into this sort of setup. So this is what we're looking to achieve, this nice rolling motion. So once again, let's flick off the reference, bring up our original plastic that we just modeled. And if we did a collision deformer with a sphere, say like a, sp fit, a sphere wants to push down and roll along this and dent into this, I find that using a high polygon mesh that's you know, got interesting shapes to it can usually break. So what I like to do is to bypass that by doing it to a simple cube or a, a simple object at least. And then we use the, a mesh deformer, which really wraps that simple cube, uh, wraps the, the detailed uh, plastic and flower and that that you've got into a mesh. And it sort of references the simple geometry. So it's a, it's a little bit hard to explain, but as we move along, you're going to understand. So let's create a cube. Let's center it in the middle here. And we'll go 450 by 450, nice and wide. Um, but we don't need it nowhere near as tall. So let's just sort of mesh around this, sort of like it's a cage. So something like that should work well. Uh, however, we've got no subdivisions in this. So if we want to collide with it and sort of get that rolling motion, you need plenty of subdivisions. So let's do 60. Cool. And what we'll use for this collision in this example is a sphere. And at the moment, it's already colliding with the cube. So we don't want to start off there. We want to have it hovering above. And if we move it to somewhere where we want it, the animation to begin, somewhere like here should be good. And we go to frame 0, hit the coordinates, and let's just set a keyframe. And let's go across to frame 90 and move it across to the other side, somewhere like that. Hit our keyframe. And what we've essentially got is just a cube, one side to the other. But however, if we go to 45 and we dip this down, we're going to now push into the cube. Uh, and no collision at the moment, but as soon as we select our cube and hold down uh, command, go into our collision deformer, there it is. 
uh, wrong way around, sorry. And we add the sphere as a collider in the tabs over here. Now if we roll down, you can see that we're colliding with it. And I've got the plastic on, so let me turn that off. And let's even turn off this sphere. Now what you can see is we've got this dynamic setup where the cube will just push into the cube and roll along and then dip back up. So this is a good start, but it's still a little bit too of a simple look. So some quick fixes is just changing the shape will help a little bit. Something like an oval shape and rotating it. That'll give it a little bit more of a dynamic look. But really, we're still hoping to get this interesting looking animation applied to that flower plastic that we did before. So this isn't going to cut it. And a way I've found to work around that is in your fall off section, you can use a whole different bunch of fall offs like cubes and sphere. And now with the introduction with fields you're in R20, you're going to be able to have a lot more experimentation. But in this case, we want to use the source, which is really just dragging in another object. And in this instance, we're going to use the plastic that we modeled earlier to be a fall off. So it sort of dips down in the middle of the plastic. But when it gets to the outer area of the plastic, it's going to say, all right, we don't want to animate and deform in that area. So what we'll do is duplicate the plastic to create a, just a fall off the reference. Let's turn this off for the minute. And let's just condense all this down. Let's select everything here, make it editable, and then right click on it and go, say, connect objects and delete. And now we've just got one clean mesh of this plastic. Let's also keep naming conventions. Fall off. And what I said before, we want to drag this fall off into the source link of the collision tab. So we can turn this off and turn back on our actual cube and everything. And you'll see now nothing. However, playing with the sample distance is sort of saying how much of this collision will be affected. And just playing around with these parameters, like I found uh, on this example, 40 works well. This is where it's going to chug a little bit. Not too bad, but you can now see that it, it's taking it into an effect. But if we turn this cube off, you can already start to see that there's like an interesting shape here. And that's actually taking into consideration the plastic fall off. You can also play with these parameters here, the weight and scale. Um, it's all going to come down to your own art direction and what sort of project you're working on and sort of the, finding those right parameters. And then under the, your advanced section, um, like cranking up over your steps or your relax and playing around with these parameters will help sort of give it a more uh, smoother motion. So something like, say, 20 steps. We'll smooth this out, and you'll sort of see that uh, that fall off shape that we did before. So because it has to do a bit of calculations, it's updating. But now you can start to see that geometry of the fall off that we've got. And we're going to be able to use this cube now with a mesh deformer on it and take it back to our original plastic. So if we went into our plastic, turn that back on, and let's just hide our cube. And let's select the, under the deformers here, the mesh deformer. There we are. And whatever is in this group here, the mesh deformer is going to follow the hierarchy and apply all this top piece of plastic, bottom piece of plastic into the mesh deformer. So a couple of quick things you need to set up with the mesh deformer. You want to say what we're meshing around. And that, in this case, is the cube. So we drag that into the cage. And then that's not going to be enough. You need to initialize it. And that's to say, let's take the, let's, that information from the cube and apply it to our original plastic. So now what you'll get is, if we went to frame 40, now it's being applied to the cube. And we're pushing this uh, plastic around. So just scrubbing through this, it has to do a calculation every time. So to speed things up, once you're happy with the look, say you're just working at a certain frame here, and you're like, OK, that's working well. What you want to do is go back to your collision deformer and go across to the cache 
and calculate that, and that'll just fake it all out and save all that information that you can scrub along your timeline nice and fast. So if we hide all this stuff and go back to our reference, just scrubbing along what I said once you've cached it, it's nice and quick, and we can see that we get that animation running there. And what we also additionally did is if we turn off the plastic in this reference, so we've got the collision, we've got our plastic. We also did the same by dropping in a mesh deformer into our inner fabric here, this top and bottom piece, and did the exact same. We dragged our cube in, we initialized it. So now we have this animation running along on the plastic on the outside and the inside meshes, and it's all clean. They're not touching or anything. And then from there, we're going to now be able to go back to our splines and start doing that sort of spring-like motion where we connect those splines in between the top and bottom fabric, adding hair to it, and really trying to get that sort of realism that we're after. Cool. So let's go back into the presentation. So before we do that, I want to just start off by showing how the spline dynamics work. And this is just one spline, but we use the hair uh, system applied to that one spline. And you can crank the hair system up from one hair to as many as your computer can handle. So there's, I think, like maybe 400 hairs in this piece. Uh, and what we learn in this one is what will take the information, apply it back into that plastic flower model that we've been making. So just a quick sip of water. So this is what we've got, a little spring-like effect with a spline. And then we've just got a couple of pieces of plast uh, like little pyramids that are constrained to the top and bottom here. Uh, let's turn that off for the minute and just start from scratch. So because in cinema we don't have just a, a line spline straight away, we have to just make it. And a quick way to do that is just by creating a rectangle. And let's do 100 by 100 centimeters and make it editable. And we no longer need these parts here. So now we've got that spline. However, we don't want it to be a closed spline. So let's untick that. That's sort of saying that it's just a loop back around on itself. So if it was a circle, it would connect itself back up. But now we just have a top to bottom piece. Spline. And once you apply spline dynamics, to this spline, you can't edit it anymore. Like I can give you an example right now. If we do hair tag spline dynamics, it automatically drops away. And that's because under spline dynamics, we have gravity enabled. If we zero that out, it now plays. But we can't edit this anymore. We can't drag this point over here or anything like that because it's all driven through your spline dynamics. So what you want to do, what you want to do first is make sure you're happy with your splines. And before going into this, to, to do a spring-like effect, you really need to say, well, we need to have some points in the middle for it to spring out and bend out. And at the moment, we've just got one at the top and one at the bottom. So let's, I could just right-click and say, add point to this spline. But to add it perfectly in the center, we can just select them both and go to Tools, sorry, Mesh, Commands, uh, Subdivide. And in our settings, if we just did one, we'll add a perfect subdivision that's centered there. And one extra little trick, pushing down, once we do that spring-like effect at the moment, we don't have any offset for the spline to say, all right, we need to push out to the left or to the right or anything like that. So by just moving the spline right now, just across a tiny little bit, will help when we do that spring-like motion to be like, all right, let's push out that way. So yeah, that's just a little trick that I found that when I was uh, setting this thing up. Um, let's start doing the constraints so then we can animate with the constraints to get the spline dynamics. So back again, hair tag, se select the spline, hair tags, spline dynamics, make sure your gravity zeroed out and we'll have nothing at the moment but let's set up our constraints. So for our constraints we'll just use a polygon, make it nice and small, something like 10 by 10 and bring it into the center here above the spline. And because we made this spline originally 100 by 100, we know it's, if we just take this polygon up 
coordinates by 50, which should sit perfectly at the top. Let's call it top. And let's duplicate it. Call this one bottom. And same again, go down to negative 50. Cool. So now what we want to do is go back to our spline, right click on it, and go back into our hair tags and say constraints. And because we've set up a top and bottom piece, we want two constraints, so I can duplicate that out. So now we've got two. And let's set up our top one. Go to our spline into our points mode. Select the top piece. And under our first constraint, just drag in our top. And then as soon as I sit set at, you're going to see that it changes to a yellow. That's now saying that this point here is constrained to that point of the polygon. And that's what we're looking for, to sort of constrain it so then when we add, animate this polygon here, the spline will follow that wherever we go. Let's just for an example, if I move this and update, you can see that it drags along. So let's do the same for the bottom piece. Select the bottom spline, go to our second constraint, drag in our bottom piece, hit set. And if we hit play, we're still not going to get anything. So let's do some animation on these constraints. We select them both, go to our coordinates, and keyframe them. Let's go to frame 90, keyframe them again. And then once again, at 45, let's just take our top piece, bring it down a little bit, keyframe on the Y, and bring our bottom piece up a little bit and keyframe it on the Y. And now what we should get is this animating and pushing that spline. Now it's looking a little bit sharp at the moment, so a simple fix. Spline, object, we're on linear at the moment. If we change this to B spline, we're going to get that nice arcing bend motion. And then when it goes back, you even get that wobble. So it's really taking into sort of dynamic simulation and the, the physics there. So from there, we want to go into our hair system. So let's select the spline. And with the command shift, we will go into hair objects, add hair. Sorry, I didn't need to do that. But you will still see that it's applied it now under the guides here. It's added this spline to the hair system. And what we've got now is hairs playing along with the spline. And hair automatically comes with dynamics built into it, which we don't need in this circumstance. So we can just go across to our dynamics on the hair and disable it. But it's still taking into account uh, the vertices of this spline and generating one hair for each vertice. And what we're wanting in this case instead is to go from spline vertex to spline guides. And what that essentially does is now just make a replica one hair on that spline system. So now you have one hair. Uh, and if we even went into the render view, you'll see that one hair there. So you can see, though, that this hair itself is still a little bit um, sharp and jar like jarring. So that comes under your segments here. It's saying there's eight pieces of hair. Let's like take that nice and high, something like 30. And now it really smooths it out. If you're still finding that like you're cranking these segments up to like 60 and it's still getting a bit sharp, you'd probably want to go back to your spline and play with the angle here. I noticed that bringing that down to something like one really sharpens everything up again. Um, but one hair is not really going to cut it for this example. So Automatically, um, we can start improving it. Let's go into the hair material that it generates automatically. Here we've got a lot of control from kink, frizz, density, clump. Like You can play a lot with these parameters right now. We only want to look at thickness just for the minute. Let's just keep it at something like 0.2 at the root and 0.2 at the tip. And that's just going to keep the same thickness top to bottom. And then whatever material you drag onto your hair system, it's going to take in that information from your glossy and your spec and um, your color, diffuse, and things like that. So if we took this octane diffuse blue here, dragged it on there, now we've got just this blue strand. Uh, and now we want to go into cloning this hair so we can get much more of that dense look. So if we go across to hairs and cloning, let's just take this up to 10. And you're going to have 10 hairs there doing the exact same constraining. But you, know, you could take this up to 100. 
and just keep going it's just whatever you want to sort of art direct and stylize. However, I was sort of wanting to achieve that look where it sort of all comes together at the top, it all comes together at the bottom, and then when it was bending, it fans itself out and gets this interesting look. So a good way to do that is in your offset curve here, is if we drag this point down, it's really saying let's pull all our root system together into the start here, and let's also do that for the tip. And now you've just got everything. There's, although there's still 10 splines there, they're all perfectly on that same spline. But what we can do now is add a keyframe here, drag that up, and now you're getting that fanning out system. Now let's take that up to 100. All right, maybe we want to take that up to 200. And you can start really getting some interesting looks. And we've only got like a root system movement of this, like where it's saying how far to move out from the original spline is five centimeters from the root and five centimeters from the tip. We can like really push this far and really comes down to your own personal project and what you're wanting to muck around with. But that's 20. And let's go up to 500. And now you get these like dense looking um, splines that you, know, you can create some interesting looks. What you can even further do is go back into our hair material and you know you could play with the kink here, you could play with the frizz, um, bend, displace, like all of these are up for your control and sort of freedom to see what you want to come up with. Like the thickness, for example, maybe when you want it to be really thin at the top here, but then it gets thick in the middle, so you can add a keyframe, and then once again bring this back down, so it sort of thickens up in these areas, but then at the top it really thins itself out and goes back to nothing. So that's pretty much how I got it in, in that last example in the PowerPoint that I showed you. There are some keyframes that I did. So if we just turn off this original one and go into our spline reference, let's turn on the hair animated. So that's essentially what I just did here. But if we went back to frame zero, you would still technically be doing that fanning out motion here because we we're pushing this up at 20. So you can see if we go to 45, I've got this at 25 centimeters, 25 centimeters again, and the offset curve like this. I hit, I hit keyframes for all of this, and then when I was back at frame zero, I keyframed it everything down, back down to two and two and much smaller. So it sort of forces everything to come sucked back in together, and you get that spring like motion. So it pushes itself back out when it's bending and yeah, you get the idea, I think. So what we've gone through and learned there now, we're going to take that knowledge and apply it to that whole uh, plastic model that we ended up deforming and animating earlier. So looks like I closed the presentation again. Here we are. Cool. So yeah, you come up with that look. These pieces of plastic, you know how we created the constraints at the start? All I did is created the two polygons and then parented them under the constraints. So they're animating along with the original constraints, but I, I uh, turned off in rendering the actual polygons, and we just leave these ones here so you get that look. So now we're looking at achieving this. So much more dense splines, and then adding spline to dynamics to this, that eventually when you add your hair system, you can go ahead and get a sort of more intricate detail where you have you know, thousands of spline hairs and you know, some areas they've got this look, but then down over here they're really pushed and bent out. And I think this is only like one area of examples that I've played with, but you could come up with a whole bunch of other sort of interesting looks. So we'll use the spline, spline dynamics, MoGraph, and the hair system. So let's get back into cinema. And let's undock this. So now we're back in that fabric where we did the collision. We rolled along it. We're back at that look there. Now to just save on time, I already made that spline where we created the 100 centimeter spline and we offset it in the middle there. So that's already set up for me to go. However, we don't want one spline now. We want one, like all splines running throughout this whole mesh here. Uh, and we can do that by using the MoGraph cloner. So let's click the cloner, drag our spline in, and then under our cloner, we don't want to use linear or anything like that. We want to use an object. And what object we want to do is pretty much the same shape. 
as this uh, flower fabric here. So if we go into our inner fabric and we just duplicated this, this top piece out, uh, turn this off now. So we've just got this top piece. Let's go back to frame zero. And if we went to our cloner and dragged in the extrude, you can see that. Let's turn this off too so you can not see that and just see the splines. Now we've got a whole lot of splines all cloning off that extrude. And they're looking a bit messy at the moment. So if we just untick a line clone, we're now going to have a whole bunch of them perfectly set up in the right spot. Well, close to being in the right spot. We've now got, that's our fabric. And they're all um, cloning themselves onto each of the vertices. But they're a little bit too high. So we can easily fix that by going to the flower inside the extrude and going to our side view. And if we go over to the center here, let's just drag that down a little bit. And what we're looking for is to create this spline setup that sits cleanly in the top and bottom of the fabric. So I'd, you know, if I was going to go any further, I'd make sure that this is perfectly aligned inside. But we're just storing it fast for this presentation. So this is looking fine. And now, if we select the cloner and say, make it editable, we're going to get quite a few splines. So let's now, we no longer need this. And let's turn off our fabric. We've got all these splines here. And to be exact, we have 7,468, which is quite a lot of spline. And I wouldn't want to be doing spline dynamics on every single one of these. I'll be here forever. So I can select them all, right click, and say, connect objects and delete. And it's just going to now condense that all down into one master spline. So master spline it is. Cool. And now we can do our spline dynamics to this. So right clicking, hair tags, spline dynamics. Remember to turn off your gravity. And we essentially go back through and do our constraints to it. So constraints, one, and two. And what we're looking to constrain to is the top and bottom pieces of the fabric. So if we constrain to the extrude here, it doesn't recognize all the information in an extrude. What you want to do is just duplicate this and make this editable. And then it's going to extrude to the proper points what um, it's, it's done from making it editable. So let's go into our side view and zoom out and just select all our top points here. And now we'll go across to our first constraint and drag in that extrude that we just made editable. And once again, we hit set. And this will all now set all those top splines perfectly in line with your uh, top piece of fabric. And then let's do the same for the bottom. Duplicate this one, put it into here, make it editable, go to our side view, select the bottom. And once again, second constraint, drag in our extrude and hit set. So technically, what we have now is our fabric still animating. And now when the top and piece get pushed together, we're going to get our splines to sort of spring along with it. Um, but just remember that everything in your fabric here is being, being referenced back to your mesh here. And as soon as you change anything in this system, your mesh isn't going to work anymore. So if I went along to, say, frame 20, the animation isn't working anymore because we did these extrudes. So it's easy, a simple fix. You just want to go back to the frame 0, click back on your mesh, and say initialize. And it's just going to take the new information and update it. So now if we went to, say, frame 40, it's going to look pretty crazy right now because we haven't cached it. So you can see it's all working, but it's going to um, go a bit slow. So that's where you want to go across into your cache and calculate it. And that'll run through over um, some time and make it all nice and fast to scrub through. So if we delete that and go back to our reference, you can see that we have those splines that are all bent down in the sec center here, yet over on the edges here, they're all nice and tall. And just like earlier, 
we did what in that previous example. We add our hair dynamics and then we clone it up so we can get much more of that dense mesh and we get it to sort of spring out where we want it to. And essentially we get it to come back into this kind of look here. So that covers that section there. It's, you know, it's, I'm skimming over it a little bit, but I wanted to show you some other things too to set up sort of this fabric look that we got on the top and bottom of the fabric. So how do we go across like setting up our materials here so they sort of sit in the right places? And then to get that realism, um, how do we add our hair and fabric and get sort of that woven hair fabric look? Um, so let's go back into cinema and jump across into our texturing setup. So what we've got here at the moment is just the top piece of fabric we're going to work with. And we've got this shape here that references this white material. And then and this whole texture setup then references this outside red uh, material here. And by using a mixed material and an octane, we get just the black and white texture to sort between which one we want to be the white, which one we want to be red. So I'll show you how to quickly set up that by using our CV splines, is it? CV art smart, sorry. Um, so originally, we've been using that spline to pretty much make all our shapes. If we go back to zero and we turn off this fabric piece here, what we were using the whole time is this loft with this cloth here. So if we turn that off, this is what we want to take into Illustrator. And there's a quick uh, technique to get that to come straight across. We can just go into our top view. And once it's selected, go into our plugins and select CV. Artsmart and do CV Artsmart copy. And that's going to copy that shape now. But if we came back into Illustrator, and we just hit paste, you can now see that we've copied that spline perfectly into Illustrator. And from here, I just sort of set it up that I can then you know, put my text. Maybe it scrubs around the side of the shape. Maybe we want centers. Maybe I want this interesting sort of shape here that sort of sits further in. Well, that would just be done by going back into cinema, uh, duplicating it, and changing this kind of shape here that we want. I'm like, all right, that looks cool. Let's copy that one. Go back to our plug, plug in CV Artsmart, copy it, back into Illustrator, edit, paste. And now you could put that shape in your center of your shape and now take that information to use it to sort of drive what materials and what colors you want to sort of um, visualize. So say something like that there I was happy with. I save that out just as a JPEG. I usually try and work with pretty high resolutions, sometimes 4K up to 8K to really, when you do take the camera nice and close in, you need that fabric attention and detail. So. Um, Back in the cinema, what you can see is it's a mixed material. I showed you this before, but what you want is your two materials. You've got your red one, you've got your white, and then they're going to mix by pulling in that te texture that we would have saved out. And the red is driven by the white, and the uh, black area is driven by the uh, red. Or did I get that mixed around? I think I did. Anyway, and then from there, these red and white materials, you know, we can add hair to this um, setup now, and you're going to get like a really great look by adding just thousands of hair on top of your fabric. Um, but I found that when you start shooting your camera through the fabric, and if you look down into the, the, the base mesh, just doing a red diffuse channel isn't really getting that realism that you want. So. Um, you want to put like a fabric material that you download off the internet there. So when it sees through the mesh, there's like, oh, OK, we've got a, like a base fabric that we could use as a displacement, a bump, a normal map, things like that. Um, however, just downloading a fabric texture off the internet, when you really want to get into those close details, they're not going to hold up well enough. So yeah, you might find a couple that are really like tileable and really small. Um, but if you're needing a, your own sort of customizable look, I'm not going to run you through how I um, do this right now because uh, it'll just take too long, but there is a tutorial on it. And so this, this here is what I created in Cinema with like a depth pass. 
and I sort of cloned and waved my own fabric using splines and the sweep, uh, the sweep nerves, and then got it sort of so it was tileable, cropped it and took it into Photoshop so it made sure it was perfectly set up. And then this material here I can use really close in and you see it down here how it, without the fabric what it looks like and you can, yeah, you can drive your normals and bumps and everything through that and then when you add your fabric on top of that um, it just helps sell that realism a bit more that when you know, you, the camera maybe shines straight down into it you can see some bump and other things going on. Um, but yeah, as I said, I'm not going to have time to run you through that, but you can find uh, someone did a tutorial earlier this year on it. It's called Shoelace Displacement Map Cinema 4D Tutorial. So uh, yeah, if you want to find more information on that, check that tutorial out. Tutorial out. He did a pretty good job. Um, and then also to just help sell that realism a bit more, we can take a fabric material like this one in the top right and layer it over uh, our initial um, tileable image here and it just helps sort of sell those imperfections and things like that a bit more. Um, so moving into the hair system. Where are we? Uh, let's actually go across to Photoshop. So this is just a cropped in view of that Illustrator file that we saved before. And what I've essentially done is taken um, that black and white texture that we saved out that we used in cinema and I've just applied in Photoshop a blur to it so we get this blurring around the edges here and what I'm looking for is that if you were going to have a, a mix between a red and white fabric and the texturing and hairs and everything you wouldn't really never see just this perfect line where it cuts through in fabric you really want to see like some like imperfections and things like that so this method here just helps sell that um, realism once again so by blurring it and then by creating a noise uh, in a single layer, uh, if we turn this from an overlay back to normal, you can see what it is. It's just a noise that I then went to filter, I think stylize, and did oil paint. And that gave that sort of look there. And now if we went back to overlay, you can see that it's overlaying and getting this sort of look here. And that's pretty close, but I sort of wanted to crank it and really find that contrast. So just by adding a curves at the end, and cranking it, you sort of just get these things here. And it's not much, but when you do get into those tight shots, you really want to, like, these things sell it, I think. Um, now let's, sorry, go back across into cinema and just show you the hair system quickly before we finish up. So, turn that off. Fabric. So the good thing with the hair system is whatever material you've got on your actual fabric here, if you apply that same material to your hair, it renders the exact same. So what we've got here is called um, Nike Fabric, and if I drag that onto this square piece of fabric that we've done, and we went into the render view, hit render. Let's just pin it to the side there so you can see it. You can see we've got this d dense piece of hair going on right here. And that hair is taking into the consideration the same material. So, okay, it's going to do white hair here um, and we've, because we've got the fabric with the white hair and the red hair and it's all going to UV map uh, appropriately. Um, and let's just say we wanted only white hair on the inside but no hair on the outside. Well, it's a pretty quick way to fix that. You can just create an octane material or any material depending on what render engine you're in go across to our opacity, bring it down to zero, and back in our Nike hair material, we want to take that opacity and just drop it into the red so we no longer have hair coming through there. And that's going to help us get like really accurate um, hair that instead of just using something like a selective and selecting your polygons and building hair off that, you can get much more of that you know, refined look going through those details there. Um, and you could even do the same. You could go into your fabric and drag that same opacity into your red. And now I've just got this custom shape that's just this. So it's a quick way of like, all right, well, I don't need these areas of the modeling. How can I turn those off? Well, let's just apply an, uh, an like a material with zero opacity on it. And that'll just like, yeah, pretty much make it invisible. Um, and then also like with hairs, you always want to be like, if you're going to be cranking up those hair numbers, 
you're really just for you wanting to be generating hair where you're going to be seeing it. So if I just selected, let's turn that off. If I selected just this top piece here and went to simulate hair, add hair, it's going to add hair to the whole thing and it's going to get crazy detailed, but I don't need hair on the bottom side of it. So you could just go into your uh, top piece here, go into our faces mode and only select the areas that you want. And let's say we're happy with that there. We only want to generate hair on that section. We would then uh, make a selection set. And now with that selection and the top uh, selected, we would go back across, add hair, and now it's only going to add to the areas that we want. So now you're going to be able to like crank up those numbers nice and high, but just in the areas that you're wanting to show. And then you know, playing with your hairs like we sort of showed you earlier, that comes under your guides, like your length here. So like we only need one centimeter, nice and short. And they're like really thick at the moment. So back into your hair materials, you'd play around with your thickness, your frizz, all these channels here to really like customize and art direct your own piece. And then lastly, yeah, showing that using that opacity can help uh, sell that realism by only having it grow where you need it to. Um, and I think I just did a close up shot of it in this presentation and the last here. So you get this sort of interesting, uh, just little looping motion, pretty much just eye candy. But yeah, that's pretty much my presentation, guys. I want to say thanks again for Maxon having me out here. It's, uh, it's great to be able to talk to you guys and just show you what I've learned and what I'm sort of up to. And yeah, chatting with other talented artists is always nice. So thank you. You guys can find me at deangiffen.com. Uh, my Instagram's there. I think it's, well, it's just Dean Giffen, but with a full stop in between my name. And also you can check out Swivet Studio if you like. So thank you. <laughs>